Victor Dirty head banger, 10-5 on the Richter Back again this time with new members It's a cane thing, we bout to get with ya Folks talking, they saying a whole lot We bringing that straight fire to blow the whole spot We keep the whole block locked like a fair pin And turn the game upside down like a head spin Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Kane Sports Countdown to Kickoff as the Miami Hurricanes get ready to travel up to Chapel Hill for what once was a much-awaited game <laughs> with the North Carolina Tar Heels that now is taking on a little bit of a different look. I'm joined today by Andrew Jones from Tar Heels Illustrated, who's going to give us some insight into what the heck is going on up at Carolina, and uh, he, of course, is going to want to know what the heck is going on at Miami. And Andrew, you know, I, I just uh, kind of set it up, but uh, all of us, when we're going through the off season and, and we're taking a look at this Miami Carolina game, we're thinking this is going to be one of the season shaping games in the ACC. And now we're sitting here and it's two reeling football teams. You know, Carolina's already got three losses in the ACC. I mean, that's absolutely stunning. Miami is just really getting started in the ACC, but uh, dropped its opener. To Virginia, uh, I mean, you, I'm sure you saw the the field goal that hit the upright that yeah. you know at the end of the game, but really Miami lost that game earlier just in the way it showed up and the way that Virginia was able to control uh, large portions of that matchup. So uh, it all comes together here Saturday um, in, at, at Carolina, and let's talk a little bit about the Tar Heels and and give people some insight. So. Uh, they're coming in three and three. I mentioned they lost three games in the conference, two and three in the conference, um, lost to Georgia Tech, lost to Virginia Tech, and then lost to Florida State uh, uh, last week at home, which uh, clearly got everybody rattled. I saw Mac Brown blaming the media for having expectations that were too high of Carolina. I'm not quite sure I've ever heard a coach <laughs> bitch that expectations are too high. So I'm going to give you the floor. Tell us what the heck is going on in Chapel Hill right now. Well, you know, to put in perspective this matchup, we did a podcast in July or early August. We were talking, having some fun, looking ahead, because we thought there's a chance North Carolina could have that special season, right? And and figure, okay, well, if Miami can – if they don't get hammered so badly by Alabama, they could probably be rolling by the time they come in. We even had subscribers on our on our site saying maybe that maybe game day will be there for that game. Certainly be an ABC night game. Well, it's ACC network. The only thing that would be more fitting for this matchup was it was a noon start instead of three thirty. So both, both I, you know, the two biggest disappointments in college football this year, you could argue, in Miami and North Carolina. I don't think Miami is as big a surprise because the Hurricanes have for have kind of developed a reputation for not living up to expectations. People keep waiting for Miami to erupt and. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. That one year it's, in the Mark Rick. Why don't you just like pound the knife yeah, into all of us? Yeah, but it's true. And other than that one year in the Mark Rick when they end up losing the pit, I mean, Miami's just kind of been that team. But but here's what I said before the season. And I did think that North Carolina had a chance to be really, really good. But when, when people asked me, and I was on a bunch of radio shows in August and we did a podcast, I said, look, North Carolina's got a program that until North Carolina punches its nose through that national ceiling. I can't project that they will. You got to see it first. It's like in basketball, they have a new coach and a lot of newness and stuff, but it's easy to say, yeah, I could see them having a really good year and being nationally relevant because the culture's in place. They've done it with different coaches, different eras, all that kind of stuff. Football, they've, they've gotten close a lot in different decades under different coaches, but they've never punched through. So until they punch through, I just can't project it. So here we are in the middle of the season they're a mess, and I say that, and I don't say that disrespectfully. They got a lot of problems. There are a lot of elements of that team that just is horrible from from one game to the next. One week they're really good at something, and the next week they're awful at it. Mac even said this week, "We've got no idea what part of our team is showing up." To paraphrase, and I would think that Miami's somewhat the same way. I mean, we look at Miami; the two wins are Central Connecticut State, that a few posters on our board didn't know how to had a team. I did tell them that they're the Blue Devils or something like that, so I guess they like that. But And also App State. They barely beat App State. Derek King, before he got injured, didn't have a big game. So Miami's got a lot of issues. He goes and gets blown issues. out the other day by Louisiana Lafayette. I mean, it, 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 exactly. it's like stunning yeah. to see these things going on. Yeah, and, and I think this past Saturday, I, I, I wrote a column afterward 
uh, the, the headline was rock bottom with a question mark. Was this rock bottom? And I'm not sure it was because what's what's amazing is the back half of their schedule is a lot more difficult than the front half. But I mean, Florida State's terrible. They're awful. And for the two quarters, the second and third quarter, Florida State had 35. They outscored Carolina 35 to 7. And they had 352 yards of offense. And Jordan Travis is throwing he threw three touchdown passes. That's not Florida State right now. Uh, Max said that Carolina's defense those two quarters, the second and third quarters, was the worst it's been since he returned. So they say communication issues in the back of the defense are a problem. They were in two different defenses in one of the touchdowns. It's the sixth game, all right? It's the 31st game of the Mac Brown, Jay Bateman era, and they're still having problems like that. And I, I just think that there's a lot to clean up for this team, and I don't, I don't see how they can just flip a switch and suddenly they're the team that people thought they would be. I just don't think it's in them right now. It's going to take another year or two before North Carolina approaches, if they ever do, what people thought they might be. All right, so how do you explain this? I mean, you know, they were a good team at the end of last year. I mean, they were they were – they looked like they were evolving into one of the better teams in college football. I mean, even in the bowl game, I think it was what Texas A&M, they, yeah. they were right there. And even though they were missing some of their best players and they were right there with Texas A&M into the fourth quarter uh, last year against Miami, they jumped out to that 34 to 10 halftime lead and ended up with a school record performance yeah. in a negative way against Miami with 700 and 78 yards of offense, 554 of it on the ground behind an offensive line that is enti- all entirely back. back this year, right? Aren't they all back? They're all back. Tight ends so back, everybody. Explain this. I can't, I mean. Well, 534 of those yards are in the NFL right now. But, you know, I think hey, this is what, what we're still trying to figure out because you go back and listen to what Mac was saying in August. And, and when he – said, you know, the media kind of had them a little bit overhyped and the expectations were too high. The program didn't deflect that stuff much, not publicly. We got a lot of positives throughout August uh, from the program. Uh, but Mac did say uh, several times, we don't really know what we have at running back. We don't really know what we have at wide receiver. And both those position groups have been significant weaknesses. And then the offensive line is clearly taking a step back. Part of it, uh, their center, Brian Anderson, has been hurt. And when they went up to Blacksburg, the excuse for six sacks and, and like, what, not even 300 yards of offense, around 300 yards of offense was, well, it was their first time in front of a crowd in two years. They couldn't hear the calls because Blacksburg was crazy that night. And Brian Anderson didn't play, so they were having some issues on the offensive line. Well, that, hadn't been the, that wasn't the case at Georgia Tech. I was there. They had 35,000 people in that, that, that 75,000-seat dome you could hear people's voices caroming off one side of the dome to the other. It wasn't a problem last week at Chapel Hill. So I think what we've seen is that the offensive line at best is mediocre. They're not running the ball well between the tackles. It's one thing to give up sacks. Like when they played Georgia state, for example, they averaged three yards of rush on 23 carries between the tackles. That was a red flag. Cause if you can't enforce your will against those guys up front, there might be a problem. And that has basically been an issue more often than not for him. Protecting Sam, I think he's been sacked 23 times. And then you've got wide receivers. This is a crazy, crazy stat, Gary. In the last two games, they have three starting wide receivers. Josh Downs is all everything. He's amazing, right? The other two starting receivers, Antoine Green is in his fourth year. Emory Simmons is in his third year. In each of the last two games, they both have one catch for seven yards. So in the last two games, their two of their three starting receivers have combined for 221 snaps, and they have four catches for 28 yards. They're not getting open. So your running backs are mediocre. Sam has 300-yard rushing games, more than the running backs do combined. Two of the receivers aren't getting open. I don't. I think that they're they feel pretty good about tight end, but you're not going to advance the ball in the air raid offense throwing to the tight end 15 times a game if that's your other option outside of Josh Downs. So offensively, they're not very good. Defensively, they're hit or miss. They're either really good for a stretch or they're really bad. And when it goes bad, they go off the rails. And it takes them a while to come back. 313 yards and 32 points in the second half against Georgia Tech. A, a very <laughs> mediocre offense. Florida State's offense is very bad. And Florida State had, like I said, 35 points, 352 yards in two quarters. In the first half against Virginia, 
Virginia had 366 yards and 28 points. So the defense can be really, really bad in stretches. And the offense is not good enough this year to overcome that. And that's why they're sitting at three and three. All right. Now, all that said, I'm preparing to educate myself here on North Carolina. And I start looking at numbers and starting on offense. Okay. They're averaging 35.5 points, 486 yards a game. You know, that's somewhat respectable. It's only a six point drop from last year. uh, And, you know, like a, a 40, 40 to 45 yard drop in yardage from last year. I mean, it's not like shut down the program. Oh my God, we can't do anything offensively. Uh, yeah. I mean, they are moving the ball at times. They are building stats. I'm assuming they've struggled to score um, because they don't have the same level of playmakers that they had a year ago. And then I look at the defense and it's actually better statistically than than last year. They gave up 29.4 points a game last year and are only given up 26.7 points a game this year. Uh, so how do you, how do you explain that? Well, they had their first two home games. They scored 59 points in both games. They scored 59 against Georgia state and they scored 59 against UVA. And that was, that was 59, 39. It was, it was a video game, basically not really football. And if you take away those two games, they have been very mediocre. They, they, the last three games, the offense has had 17 or fewer points at the end of the third quarter. They had 24 total points against Duke at the end of the third quarter, but they had a they had a defensive touchdown. And against Virginia Tech, they finished with 10 points. So they've had two ex- big time explosive offensive performances. They had over 600 yards in both games, but the other four games, I think, is really who they are. And now, didn't they explode against Virginia? It was a yeah, close yeah, game they early. Had 50, yeah, they had yeah. 699 yards, 59 points. I mean, they they moved the ball at will against Virginia. They basically scored on every possession. They had a missed field goal. They didn't punt against Virginia. That game, they looked like last year. The rest of the season, even Georgia State, like I said, they weren't running the ball between the tackles well, and they hit on some big plays. And sometimes you hit on a 75-yard touchdown, it can mask a lot of stuff. And that game was kind of – and Georgia State's not very good. So I don't think that's a barometer game. The other ones are, and they've only been really good on on offense in one of their five ACC games. They scored 38 points against Duke, but one of them was seven points were a defensive touchdown. Duke's not very good. And they they, they didn't enforce their will against Duke. It was still – they had to work hard for what they got. Last year, Mark Packer on on, uh, Packer and Durham, last year he used to refer to Carolina's wide receivers as Frisbee catching dogs. Basically, they're just running up and down the field, and they had two NFL running backs. They don't have that right now. Josh Downs is fantastic. I think they got some talent at wide receiver, or excuse me, at tight end. And Sam Howell's really good, but I think Sam's clock is messed up now because guys aren't getting open. There's not a good pass rush, and he's just taking off and running sometimes. He's getting beat. He's getting hit 18 to 24 times a game. And he's wow. Getting popped. Some, well, that's what got really to Derek King. De'Ara King was getting yeah. destroyed early in the year. And, and as you know, he's now out for, out for the year. Uh, yeah. Miami has a second quarterback that's also out. Um, so that I, actually, I'll ask you this question as well. I mean, I'm watching the FSU game a little bit. And I'm watching uh, Travis running all over the place on Carolina's defense. And a lot of their big plays in that game that kept drive, drives alive and stuff were Travis uh, running and and like nobody being home. So Miami is obviously seeing that. And with two quarterbacks already on the injured list, I'm wondering, uh, Tyler Van Dyke can run a little bit. We saw him take off and go up the sideline against Virginia for a touchdown. Uh, He can move a little bit when he wants to. Um, I just wonder how much Miami is going to want to try to exploit that because if they lose Tyler Van Dyke, now they're down to a a walk-on or a kid that's never really been in a game. No, actually, neither is the walk-on, and the, the you know their season's toast here. You know if they lose Van Dyke, so I wonder how much Miami will be willing to try to exploit that. Well, running quarterbacks have had a lot of success against Carolina since uh, Mac returned. It's something that they have a hard time explaining. And in fact, uh, Jordan Travis had a 53-yard touchdown run. Mac has told us that there was a play, uh, somebody on one of the touchdowns Saturday that. The excuse for why somebody was out of position is something he had never heard of before. 
And, you know, he's been doing this for 47 years. Whatever. He's like, it's twice. He said he went out of his way to tell us this Monday. And then yesterday on Wednesday after practice, he told us again. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you what it was because then you'll figure out who it was. I don't want to embarrass the young man. But that's kind of where they are. They, I, I've been I, now at the end of the week. I have a little bit of time. I'm going to go back and watch those touchdowns. I'm going to try to figure out what actually happened. I'll probably keep it to myself. I won't embarrass the kid. But that's where they are. When you've got a coach who's seen it all, and then suddenly he's seen something he hadn't seen before, and it results in a touchdown. That's kind of where they are. So I actually believe in looking at this game. I think Miami's going to have to throw to win for the reasons you just said. Plus. I would think that that's Van Dyke's strength anyway. You know, he's mm-hmm. a little bit more of a – looks like a more of a pro-style guy. Looks like he's got a nice arm. He's got a little bit of experience under his belt. He's got 16 days for a lot of guys to heal now and look at film and, and learn a lot about the mistakes he's been making. And, and I thought he closed pretty well against UVA, so he showed some growth. And uh, Carolina can be susceptible. I mean, mm-hmm. they may show up Saturday, and, and they may be the Chicago Bears in 1985 on defense for three quarters. It's that one quarter – where maybe they're not, or there's two quarters where they're not, where they could lose the game. Or they could be really good the whole game. Who knows? But I do think Miami's path to a victory is to just throw at those corners, especially if they're playing soft, pick your way down the field, and then use that quarterback run or use that one of those zone runs to a running back to try to get some big breaks in the defense. It can be done because I've seen it happen a lot this year. If Jeff Sims and Jordan Travis, neither of whom are very good passers, can run and, and systematically hit on some big pass plays to complement the run and, and shred North uh, North Carolina's defense, then I think that Miami, with what they have, especially at wideout with Rambo and some of those guys, I think they have a chance to put up some points this weekend. And I do think yeah. that's their path to victory. Yeah, I'm expecting a shootout in this game. Now, um, Sam Howell, I mean, we came into the season at least believing he's an elite quarterback and one of the better quarterbacks in the country. Uh, he's hitting on 60.5% of his throws, 1,697 yards, 16 touchdowns, five intercept, interceptions. So he's protecting the ball relatively well. And you noted that he also runs a lot. He's got almost 400 yards rushing and three more touchdowns as a rushing quarterback. Um, so stats are kind of, co- you know, somewhat comparable to a year ago, not too big of a disparity. Uh, I mean, he had 35 touchdown passes last year. He's got 16 so far this year. So, I mean, a little bit off, but not like too crazy. Um, how is he holding up mentally through the team's struggles? I don't know. Uh, he he doesn't show anything. You know, he's a guy that can win the lottery, and you wouldn't know it. Mm-hmm. He'd be no different than if uh, you know someone stole his lunch money. If you know what I mean. And he's just a guy that's so even keeled. As much as I covered Russell Wilson when he was at NC State, and Sam reminds me of him in that he's just so uber focused, uber driven. The next thing, you know, whatever just happened, it happened. You move on to the next thing. That's just kind of Sam. But I do think it's probably affected him some because I can see the frustration during the game because he doesn't look like the guy from last year at times. If you can't go through your progression, you know, you got two clocks going on. This is what I've been telling people what I think is going on with Sam. You got the pass route clock, the timing of the different routes that are being run, and then you got that clock that's going really fast saying, get the heck out of there because you're about to get creamed, and you're our best running back too, so just take off. They've been telling him to run. You know, earlier in the year, he ran – he passed for 300 and ran for 100 in, t- in two consecutive games. Hmm. The only guy in FBS or in Power 5 football to do that uh, since 2004, aside from Lamar Jackson. But wow. I, 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 but they were boasting that. They were celebrating that, and I was like, that's not a good sign. I don't think Sam Howe – Tucking that thing under and running is the best path to victory. He needs to be throwing the ball. And and the crazy stat is in five ACC games, he's only completed six passes 20 yards or more downfield. Thrown 20 yards or more downfield. And most of those have been the Josh Downs, right? Uh, Well, yeah. And and the other day, um, he had three of them against Florida State. Yeah. So I I think that Sam is dealing with the fact that the pass – they run RPO 80, 85% of the time. And if you're not running the ball between the tackles, teams aren't going to bite the RPO that much. They're not going to trust it. So mm-hmm. it makes it more difficult. Then he's got a line that's not pass protecting for him. Then he's got receivers. Two of the three starters aren't getting open. And then Choffrey Brown, who is De- – Deami Brown's little brother. Deami's in the NFL with Washington now. He is an unbelievable athlete, but he gets open and drops the ball. He's got one catch and four drops this year. 
And he's a kid who had 15 receptions last year in a second tier role. So, so I don't think, I think Sam has, is having a tough time trusting his receivers. They're not getting open. Uh, they're not running the ball well conventionally. There's not good pass protection. So in some ways, I think the production he's put up speaks volumes to his talent because a lot of quarterbacks would have buckled and really be struggling. And four of his five interceptions were balls the offense or the receiver could have gotten. They were either tipped or they just didn't wrestle. Two of them were wrestled away on the ground. Hmm. So there, you can see there's a lot of little things that are missing that add up to be a lot. They're just mm-hmm. not what they were. Sam hasn't looked like the guy that he was before. And um, they are kind of who they are. I think after six games – You've kind of revealed who you are. So if you're if you're Manny Diaz, I, I think you got to take Josh Downs. You got to try to take him out of the equation. I mean, that's the guy that'll break your back if you you just can't let that guy be running all over the place. So they'll probably double cover Josh Downs a lot, I would think, um, and make these other guys get open and 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 beat them. So then it comes down to last year and the way they were able to run the ball, and it's the same guys. It's the same guys. It's a worse Miami defensive line. Okay. So to me, like, you know, one plus one equals two uh, until you tell me that these aren't the same dudes. And like, they haven't been for whatever reason, but um, they manhandled Miami's defensive front last year and the linebackers and, and Miami's not as good as they were a year ago up front. So conventional wisdom would be at home, a desperate team, a, a pissed off team, um, you know, Stacey Searles, who would love nothing more than to run the ball down Manny's throat, Mac Brown, who would love nothing more but to embarrass Manny into a further hot seat than he's already residing in. Uh, maybe they put the game in the hands of their offensive line again and, and, and come up with some things schematically that they can do against those guys because uh, that makes the most sense to me. I, I think they got it. Miami's got to take Josh Downs out. And North Carolina, coming off of what they were able to do last year, running the ball, has to try to run the ball. Uh, so can they do think, it, Andrew? Can they do it? I, I don't know. And I'll tell you, last week, Florida State started doubling up on Josh, and he had two false starts. So I asked Phil Longo on Monday, the offensive coordinator, about that. And I think it's like, man, I got two guys. He's starting to get all the attention. And when you get two false starts, meaning he was very eager to get off get off the snap. So I, I don't know. Maybe Miami can do that to him. Josh finds a way to get open. He is their big play receiver, and he's their possession receiver, which is not a good sign. You'd like to have right. different guys have those roles. So as far as the run game goes, I'll ask you this. My take on that game last year, I was down in Miami for that game last year. It looked to me like Miami just wasn't ready to play. They wore the black uniforms. They went through all that stuff. but They just weren't ready. And uh, Carolina handled them, but they handled a team that wasn't ready. So what does that tell you? What is this? I don't want to take away from what they did because it was an amazing performance. But I would think the other side, and I think some of the people I've talked to around here this week say, Miami's going to come down fully motivated to try to you know, correct a wrong, and they were embarrassed at home last year. They had oh, a no. hurt street there. I mean, that was a terrible look. for. And honestly, Miami hasn't been the same team since. Mm-hmm. And, and they haven't gotten off the mat from that game, basically. No. So maybe this is the opportunity to do that, and they need this game to kind of rally guys around. The college athletes, especially football players, you got all those different personality dynamics. It's a tough thing for a coaching staff to deal with. There are times where – Mac and other coaches I've covered said, boy, we had a great week of practice, and I don't know what happened when they ran out of the tunnel on Saturday. And there are times they say, gosh, you know, it wasn't a very good week of practice, but they a play happens early in the game, it galvanized the team, and boom, they take off. I don't think either coach has a clue what club's going to run, what, uh, which club of theirs is going to run out of the tunnel on Saturday. And that's why I think in the five uh, questions I did for you, I said, I think the team that wins this game is a team that doesn't lose the game as much. I think it's mm-hmm. going to be lost. These are two teams that hurt themselves. Miami with the penalties, Miami having trouble uh, in various aspects of the game. Um, I think they have red zone issues on defense and stuff. Carolina doesn't – I don't think they have as many warts, but I think they might be a more wounded team right now because their expectations were even higher, and they haven't been – they haven't had those expectations before. So I still think there's a lot of soul searching going on. So I, 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 I can see this game playing out that Carolina can try to run between the tackles and try to you know, enforce their will. But they don't have Michael Carter and Javante Williams doing it. 
Yeah, I think Clash is an okay back, the kid that came over from Tennessee. I think DJ Jones has a nice, potentially a nice future. He's got to stay healthy. But they're not Michael and Javante. And the line knows they're not blocking for Michael and Javante. They're still going to have a problem at center. I mean, last week against Duke, two weeks ago against Duke, they played Caden Baker at center, kid from Florida, by the way. Um, it was the first time he'd ever snapped the ball. And he started snapping that week. And hmm. he got 19 reps in the game at center. So on offense, if you're if you're not in good shape at the center position, it affects the rest of the line. So I don't think North Carolina can run for 300 yards in this game, which would still be a little more than half of what they got last year. Yeah. Miami. I don't think that's their recipe. I think their recipe is another guy getting open, Sam hitting him, and then hitting Josh Downs and winning through the air and just not making as many mistakes as the opponent. I think that's their recipe to success this Saturday. You mentioned Ty Chandler. He transferred from Tennessee. He's averaging five and a half yards a carry so far this year, so that's not terrible. Uh, has five touchdowns. Uh, but, no, he's not – Michael Carter and Javante Williams. There's no no question about it. So uh, it's going to be interesting, you know, um, to see Carolina on offense and what they're able to put together. Now, defensively, um, I talked about how they're statistically better on defense than they were a year ago, but they're having a really hard time pressuring quarterbacks. Yeah. Uh, that's been kind of like uh, their Achilles heel, and that gives, obviously, the quarterback time um, – to find guys open downfield. And they're also haven't really been able to replace from what I could see a uh, Chaz Surratt uh, yeah. very successfully, who was just a great linebacker uh, in the middle of that defense uh, a year ago. Uh, so give us your summation, I guess, of, of, of Carolina on defense, why they've struggled and why it, it can be better or worse, depending on what you think on Saturday. Well, there are two – uh, major points of emphasis on defense throughout the offseason, throughout fall camp was A, get to the quarterback more. They have 11 sacks. B, force more turnovers. And they force seven turnovers. I mean, Miami, I don't think, even done that. So that'll be interesting. Good turn. Neither team force a turnover. Saturday will turn into a turnover fest. You know? Yeah, right. But, but I do think you're right. I, not having Chaz, Chaz was just a ball buster. Chaz was a guy that if he's he's going to get to the quarterback, he was going to make plays. He gave them the combination of athlete and ferocity on the field that I think this group misses sometimes. They have a lot of missed tackles. But here's the thing. Carolina's defense really doesn't have those bend but don't break stretches. It's like they're either getting a three and out or a five and out, or they're giving up a long drive for a touchdown. And, and I think that that's – they got to figure out what happens on that sixth, seventh, and eighth play that keeps a drive going. Sometimes it's a penalty. Uh, a lot of times it's a third down conversion. Like, like Florida State had a third and 12. And Jordan Travis threw an 18-yard pass, just a simple out play right in front of Carolina's bench. There was no DB near him. I don't understand why the DB wasn't in press coverage on something like that or a little bit closer. But they got 18 yards. It was uncontested. They have stuff like that that comes up. So they have to figure out a way to, when it starts going bad in a series, to, to get to get the stop. And Max says that that's having a leadership on the field. That's having a guy step up. They have a slogan called Be the One. Someone's got to step up and make a play. Someone's got to step up on second and four and turn that into third and eight. And then you have a chance of making a play. Uh, they haven't done that. But when Do they, they have play, the athletes to do it? They have the athletes, no doubt about okay. it. I, I think, and there's there's a belief right now, 31 games into Mac Brown part two with Jay Bateman as defensive coordinator, a lot of people believe that they're over They're One of their big issues is communication. And Jeremiah Gimmel is their middle linebacker, the captain of the defense. He said after the game Saturday, well, you know, you got the safety, you got the bandit talk, and the free safety talk in the corner and the nickel talking and me talking. I would say every, pretty much everybody runs tempo. You got about 14 seconds to get situated in pre-snap. If you got four or five guys communicating, how can you get situated? There are times when the ball is snapped and Gimmel's back is to the ball because he's trying to get guys lined up. They're either not getting the signals in right or some of the guys don't understand it. Georgia Tech scored a touchdown a couple of weeks ago. There were 13 players on the field for Carolina, and none of them were set. So they're, but, the, but against Duke, they had no communication issues. They didn't have any of those breakdowns. They graded out very highly on defense. So that's the thing that is so hair-pulling to Mac and the staff is that one week their communication is terrible. And, and look, if you're not communicating back there and you play a little bit of an eccentric defense like they do, 
then the whole thing is going to fall apart. But if you are communicating and you're leaving a little bit more base, then you can be more effective. So the belief from some very, very smart people who know the game is that they're over schemed and sometimes huh. it's, it's too much for them to handle and it gets the best of them. Interesting. All right. Before I let you go, I think we got to touch on the Mac Brown versus Manny Diaz, um, you know, elephant in the room, so to speak. Uh, you know, obviously Mac fired Manny at Texas. Um, I'm sure that didn't go over very well. Um, you know, Mac probably blames Manny for a lot of his downfall at Texas and, you know, th different things. I'm sure there's still some sore feelings there. Mac obviously relished what he was able to do at Hard Rock Stadium last year. Uh, what do you think that 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 is in in the scope of Saturday's game? Well, I was telling you before we, we you hit the record button that something jumped out at me Monday was you know, Mac is Mac is so prepared. He's the most prepared coach I've ever dealt with when it comes to dealing with the media. He's got a, a laundry list of things he wants to address. And he always, on his Monday pressers, ends his his opening uh, uh, his opening statement, if you will, which is usually about nine or ten minutes before he starts taking questions, by addressing the upcoming opponent. He never mentioned Miami. Now, that could have been for a couple of reasons. One, he took some time out of his opening period to uh, – talk about a suicide issue they've had at UNC's campus. So he went there. And also, like, there's so many things for them to clean up at Carolina that maybe he just addressed that a lot more and it was time to take questions. And I'll go ahead and deal with Miami on Monday. I don't know why. I'm not going to guess why. I'm just, you know, throwing out different options. Or it may have been why he didn't do it. But he never mentioned Miami. And somebody texted me five minutes. Somebody in the media texted me five minutes after his presser and said, he didn't mention Manny. Because Mac, Mac's got a lot of friends in the business, and he likes – this guy's a good friend. He's a dear friend, and I got all respect for him. But by not mentioning him means he didn't have to BS anything like that. It also means he didn't have to criticize. So I'm not going to speak for Mac. I do not know why that, that he didn't mention him. He did talk about his program a lot, his team a lot on Wednesday, say so more than made up for it. But I thought it was interesting. I, I think Mac – I don't think Mac is a guy, at least he gives us the appearance that he doesn't hold a lot of grudges. He, he's been around long enough. He understands this is a business. Guys get fired. It happens. But I also got the sense that he really enjoyed what happened last year. And, 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 and maybe maybe some stuff that Manny has said either behind the curtain in recent years fueled some of that. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for things I'm not privy to, but – I would think that Mac would get a tremendous amount of enjoyment winning this weekend. And I think Manny would get a tremendous and probably more enjoyment for getting back at him, A, because he's Mac, and B, because of what happened last year. And it would take some of the heat off of him. It would take some, well, yeah. And that's the yeah. thing. Manny's got heat right now. Mac doesn't have any heat. Some of his assistants right. do. Yeah. But well, uh, Mac's got plenty of job security, obviously. Yeah. If Manny, lo if Manny loses Saturday, it's only going to get worse down here in South Florida. Well, well let so, me ask you, since, since we're talking, let's say Carolina beats them like 45 to 10. Does Manny finish the season? I don't know. I mean, you know, the athletic director, Blake James, stuck his neck out in hiring Manny. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you're going to have to cut off his left arm and maybe his right arm too to get him to make that move, um, you know, because it's a reflection on him. And when he gives up and and pulls the plug on it, he's essentially giving up on what he – I mean, he went rogue to make that hire. I mean, nobody else was involved. He he did the deal in, in, a, in a couple hours on a Sunday afternoon when nobody was around and, and, yeah. and just sort of force-fed it on the university, and he's got to be accountable now. He's got like $15 million or plus invested in Manny Diaz now. Uh, so he's not going to make that move very easily. Obviously, there's a lot of um, angst, I would say, amongst the fans, amongst the boosters, amongst the media in South Florida. Uh, and they're looking at the athletic director as well. And uh, But there doesn't seem to be an, ap an appetite to fire the athletic director. So he still has the support of the board of trustees. And they need Manny to win because if, if they keep losing, they've lost five straight games to power five teams now. Yeah. They keep stacking that up. Like, I don't, you know, I don't see how they're going to not make a move, you know, and maybe in both positions. Well, the, the boosters can't let him go rogue on the next move. That's for sure. Oh, that won't happen. Yeah. yeah I don't, you know, 
it's, remember, remember back in the day of search committees? Yeah. Remember, maybe the, uh, Chuck, Chuck Nidus, remember him? He was like the most popular yeah. guy in college football for about five or six years. And I remember talking yeah. to him over an NC State search when Tom O'Brien was hired. And nobody talked, nobody ever hears his name anymore. Everyone wants to go rogue, you go a different way of doing it. And, and yeah. whether schools are firing coaches every three years, maybe they should have a search committee. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, there'll be people fighting each other at Miami to be on the search committee, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's it's like the, the, the problem with these things is when you make a mistake like that, you're, you're always paying for it two years down the road. And yeah. it just keeps going forward and forward and forward. And, the, and it, it takes forever to, to recover from these type of mistakes. A, a lot of it's not just Blake James on Miami. I mean, so many of these athletic directors just screw up their programs. And like, look at Florida State and what they're going through there. Um, oh, gosh. You know, what a disaster the Willie Taggart hire turned out to be. Um, you know, Jimbo, I think, lost some of his staff and things like that. And it just went bad on him at the end, with, you know, whatever. And he probably knew he had to get out and let things well, go. Well, he, he, he was contributing to that some, too. My understanding no is some of, the, some of the stuff he was doing that people didn't see was really yeah. affecting yeah, the, no the amount of time he was putting into the program. Yeah, no I doubt. talked to somebody. I was at ACC tip-off in Charlotte, the basketball media day, and I talked to someone from FSU, and they're like, you know what? They firmly are behind Norvell. They just realized that he's not rebuilding that Florida State helmet. He's rebuilding something very different. Yeah, and he's got to get it back to that. But they said, don't think Florida State when you think it's rebuilt. Think of a different program that's never really been that good. That's how bad the shape the program is in right now, and certainly was when he took over. But Miami's not in that bad shape. Miami, I think, is a is a quick rebuild for whoever takes over because the talent is there. Um, the, the foundation is there. They're not, they're not like Florida State. They're not starting, they're starting from scratch. Yeah, yeah they, 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 there are some players in the program. Uh, Somebody, especially in the Coastal Division, someone could step in there next year and, and have them in the ACC title game. They got enough talent. Yeah, they also could go the other way. This is true, but I'll tell you what. Get worse and, and this is something that I've been talking about lately. Is that when you look at uh, when you look at talent, and people always say, "Oh, it's about the Jimmys and the Joes." I think when you look at over scheming today in college football, which I think coaches overdo stuff more now than ever before, that it's not so much about the Jimmys and Joes. It's also about the scheme. You could put the best 11 defensive players in the country on the field at one time. When you got them in the wrong scheme, they're going to give up yards. They're going to give up points. You Because if you have a scheme that has them guessing this way and the play goes that way, suddenly they're no faster than the average guy on the field. And yeah. I think that with Miami, you get you get the right scheme in there. You get the right culture, the right mindset. You can win right away there. No doubt that if Miami, to I mean, I've been telling our to me. I look at the situation, and I there's two guys that I've got in my mind that if that if they would bring them into the building, this thing would flip very very quickly. Uh, one is Alonzo Highsmith, former player who's been in the NFL front office work for the last couple decades. Um, like a total alpha male, kick-ass kind of guy, yeah, yeah. you know, like urgency, intensity, passion, accountability, stands for all those things every single day. And that's something that's sorely lacking at the Miami Athletic Department right now. And then on the field, um, Mario Cristobal, the head coach at Oregon, who has now developed to the point of his career where he is one of the top head coaches in the country, really, and recruits at an insane level, which is what Miami needs. Uh, with all these SEC teams coming into South Florida and and, and poaching talent, um, if they would get those two things in place, I think you'd see Miami back to being a, a top ten team just pretty much every single year. Um, well, but know, Cristobal did some stuff at Oregon. They, Oregon was sliding off from where it was, and he kind of got that thing going. Again. Yeah, he's got that thing back on track. Well, I, still, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in discipline in college because if you give those kids a leash, you give them one foot leash, they're going to take three feet. No doubt. Especially at my, it seems like that's the case at Miami more than anywhere else. Yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah. yeah it, it, there's a lot of things that have slipped at Miami, so we'll see what happens. You know, right now I think you got a lot of guys uh, in self-preservation mode. When you look at the athletic director, the head coach, um, you know, Manny's fired half his staff the last two years. You know, that's, it, nice. that's like you know that you you you've been around a long time. That doesn't work. You know, you know, Mac, Mac said earlier this week, uh, he, he took full responsibility. He said, I take full responsibility. I hire people are on our assistance. They want our assistance. I hired them. So it's my responsibility. So if a coach is hiring and firing assistants all the time, they may think that they're 
doing what they got to do for the program, and then they're, they're, they're pointing the blame at that guy. And ultimately, it's on them. They're the ones that hired him. Well, you did, you fired a guy one year after you hired that guy. What does that say about you? And a first time head coach doesn't have the network. You, you're all, you know, that's what you're buying when you're buying a guy that hasn't done it before. You're, you're going to get an inexperienced coaching staff or an unproven coaching staff. And that's yeah. what Manny got. And, you know, he's, it is what it is. You know, I mean, you know, he, he's a, he's an okay guy and all that, but I mean, you can't, you can't look at Miami football right now and, and, and say with, with any confidence at all that it's going anywhere under the, the current leadership and it's just a question of how long they want to keep prolonging the pain because every year that goes by you're paying two years into the future so we'll see what happens the perception up here is that in fact i was watching the, my wife doesn't watch sports really at all but she was in the room and we're watching them at, toward, at the end of virginia game and, and they screwed that up I, I just think if you could score a touchdown score a touchdown don't play for a field goal with a friend i know borgalis is a good kicker and all but i told her before that kick i said they're gonna do something to screw this up Bad snap, the laces aren't going to be the right way, and they missed the field goal. And it was just, I think that to me, that from, from my vantage point up here, that's another sign that it's just not working. And by the way, very quickly, uh, I did my ACC basketball preseason ballot this morning, and I had Isaiah Wong on my first team. So I thought you might. Did you really? He's yeah. a good player. Miami's going to be better this year. They're yeah, going to be better. So. They're, they're, they're short, one big, but at the guard and forward positions, they're, they're going to be very good. I just want to see uh, Larry Nagel be able to have five on five in practice with scholarship guys. That's a good start right there, right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, All right, he's Andrew games. Jones from Tar Heel Illustrated. Man, thank you so much for your sure. time, your your insight. We'll we'll see you up there in, in another day or so, and um, looking forward to it in a different kind of way. I mean, it, yeah. it's not it's not an ACC season shaping game. We don't think unless Miami can somehow find some magic and run off uh, seven straight victories here to end the season. But uh, it's going to be interesting nonetheless just because of the way the season's gone. So thank you uh, so much for your time. Um, for Andrew Jones, I'm Gary Furman. Thank you for joining us on Kane Sports Countdown to Kickoff. We'll see you next time, everybody.